elsewhere, a new breed of 12-year-old game designers was resurrecting the industry in their bedrooms, and they were about to become teenage millionaires. In the early 80s, in classrooms, schoolyards, and bedrooms, British teenagers were plotting a revolution. They were the nerdiest kids in school, sci-fi geeks who were good at math, but had few friends. But they were about to make millions. It started as a hobby, and yes, it turned into um, obsession, um, turned into a career, I guess. Twins Philip and Andrew Oliver were typical British teenagers. Their parents wouldn't let them have a TV game console, but computers were considered educational. Just at the right time, a whole series of cheap personal computers, like the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64, came on the market. Thousands of British parents bought them for their kids to help with their homework, but the kids had other ideas. Without anyone to tell them otherwise, they discovered they could make their own games, as good as the arcades, and even better. The leading edge was what was happening in the arcades. But the problem with arcades was they had to kind of take your 10p or 20p and give you only one minute's worth of fun. Whereas the computer games, yes. kids can play it all evening, every evening if they want. The Oliver Twins taught themselves how to write game programs from scratch. In 1982, at just 13 years old, they submitted their first game to a games magazine, and it was published. The game was called Roadrunner. It was just so cool to be able to sort of go into school and say, look, that's our work, and just like run through it with kind of other kids. It was just blocks of single colors. It kind of raced up the screen and the track moved down the screen. And we used to challenge each other, how long can you last? It, it slowly got narrower and narrower and twistier and twistier with good random in there. Um, so it'd eventually knock you off. The magazine paid them $75, a lot of extra pocket money for two 13-year-olds. Next came an opportunity to be on television. They entered a game into a competition for a kid's TV show. We wrote a game, sent it in, um, and we won first prize and we appeared on television. And that was kind of great, but it was so funny because they said afterwards, we were the only one that actually sent in a game. They didn't actually mean for people to write games. They wanted you to design on paper, wouldn't it be cool if a character did this and this, whereas we'd actually written a game. Offers to buy their games flooded in, and the twins' hobby turned into a cottage industry. We did a whole series of games yeah, here. First, first um, few. This is Killer P and KB. KB. There were many times where you just worked straight through the night, and you had school in the morning, and we'd just sort of like break up, like, you're going to do all the arrows shooting and boulders dropping, and you're going to do this. And you'd go to sleep, and you'd wake up, and it's like, oh, cool, there's a new feature in the game. we just keep working and working and working. And we were starting to get suspicious when you had birds tweeting at the window, and it was getting brighter outside. You know? And you hear the milk flag, like, mmm. Yeah. Publishers distributed their games all over the country, but the twins got paid very little. By the time they were 18, their parents thought it was time they went to college and got a real job. But a teacher persuaded the parents to give the boys one year to turn their hobby into a business. And a few weeks later, everything changed when they met the Darling Brothers. Richard and David Darling had also been inventing their own games since they were 11 and 12 years old but they were unhappy with the token amounts of money that game companies were offering teenage designers. So they sold their games by mail order, setting up their own company in a spare room at home. They duplicated their games on cassette, printed their own artwork, and eventually sold a million copies. At just 17 and 18, they set up their own games publishing company, Codemasters. And at their first trade show, they met the 18-year-old Oliver Twins. The Oliver Twins came in and uh, and we sat down and they showed us a, a demo of one of the games they'd done previously. They're going, yeah, um, yeah, a game like that, yeah, we'll give you ten thousand pounds for it. And we were just like, we were just staggered. If they've said that they're uh, that they were their jewels hit the floor and they, they they were very excited, they must have concealed that quite well. We couldn't get home fast enough. Um, and we just didn't sleep. Within about a month, we wrote Super Robin Hood, uh, which went straight to number one by Christmas. We'd sold 100,000 units and made 10,000 pounds, and in fact, it carried on selling, so we actually made a little bit more. Just couldn't believe it. But of course, the minute it started selling, we just couldn't stop, so we just started rattling out more games for Codemasters.
It was one of the most successful collaborations in computer game history. We worked out that 50% of all Codemaster games uh, were actually written by us. The Oliver Twins were also working on a secret project. They wanted to invent something radically new, a game centered on an animated character. That character was Dizzy. We wanted like, this fantasy world. I had this idea. We should get the character's face as big as possible on screen to give it a bit of personality. They got an awful lot of fan mail in the Codemasters all about it and asking how do you do this and how do you do that. And every time we went up, they go, oh, we got some more fan mail. Dizzy was an international hit. The game's top bestseller charts all around the world. One stage we had different Dizzy games at number one, two, three in the charts, which is a bit like the Beatles of the games industry. Teenage computer game millionaires became national celebrities, hitting the headlines and showing off the spoils of their success. There were quite a few Ferraris bought by people who'd kind of just passed their test, but um, those Ferraris didn't last very long, I don't believe. <laughs> The result of all this hard labor was a massive creative contribution to game design. These were games designed by gamers for gamers. Thanks to the home computer era, Britain now contributes more game designers and programmers to the games industry than any other country. I remember saying to a journalist, it's like, one day, this will be bigger than TV. Um, and, it, I mean, right now, the UK games industry actually has bigger export than the British film and TV put together. But back in the early 80s, while British teenagers were the stars of the home computer era, new stars were also rising in the East. The center of the industry was about to shift again.